Hey, was that not a powerful time of worship together? Just me, come on. So thankful for the worship team, for Tariq, for audiovisual, everyone that makes that possible. Well, welcome to The Gathering. We are glad that you can make it here today on this fine Sunday morning. The Gathering is a place where you can belong, you can believe, and you can become. Belong to a church that loves you. Believe in the God who is bigger than you and become who God created you to be. A lot of people with churches say, I, I don't know if I belong. I believe this. I, I've gone through this. You don't know my story. All you need to know, know is that you belong to God. You belong to this church. And the more you belong, then you notice as you learn, as you grow in your faith and your walk in Jesus, you begin to believe the things because you belong to his family. And so we hope that you belong, you believe, and you become. Uh, all right, let's get into the word of God. We are nearing the end of our summer sermon series called Not a Coconut. Not a Coconut. If you didn't know, there was a song in kids' ministry that we would sing that the fruit of the Spirit is not, fill in the blank, some sort of fruit, right? The fruit of the Spirit is not a tangerine. It's not an orange. It's love. It's joy. It's peace. It's patience. And we have some special guests here that have stayed in town for the wedding last night of John and Emma. And it was a great time. And we've got some of the people that I've grown up in in the church that I grew up with. Some Sunday school teachers, some junior Bible quiz teachers of mine. And so just the nostalgia of kids' church is really strong with me this morning. And, and before, you know, afterwards you're going to want to go and ask, is there any embarrassing stories about math from this childhood? Let me just save you uh, that trouble. You don't need to bother these people. I know, I know what they're going to say. They're going to say, Matt was perfect. Like, there's really nothing to say. There's really no stories there. So let's just, are we on the same page? We don't have to do that. We don't have to go down that road this morning. All right. Uh, we're continuing to look at the fruit of the Spirit. Last week, we looked at kindness. We said the kindness of God is developed in us, and it's meant to be contagious. The kindness of God is meant to be shared with the world. And the world, that doesn't mean just our friends. It doesn't mean just the people that we get along with. It also means the people that we struggle to get along with. God has called us to be kind to all people, to extend, extend that kindness to someone who maybe has offended you in the past. And today we're going to attempt something we have not yet done in this series. We are, we are going to attempt to pair two fruit of the Spirit together. No pun intended there. So pair two fruit of the Spirit together. I'll just make sure, you know, aren't you grateful I'm above doing those types of puns? Those would be annoying, right? That would be absolutely ridiculous. To be that would be annoying. Peach one of you would be upset at me, probably. Okay, I'm done. I'm done. Can you tell I've been holding on to that for a while? To this series? Okay. Right. Today, we are going to do, we are going to pair together the fruit of goodness and faithfulness. One sermon, two fruit of the Spirit. They said it couldn't be done, but we're going to try to do it here today. And a message simply entitled, Oh Goodness, It's Faithfulness. Oh Goodness, It's Faithfulness. We're going to look at goodness we're going to look at the fruit of faithfulness, and then we're going to combine them together at the end. Let's look at first the fruit of goodness. Uh, last week, again, we talked about kindness. You might think, you know, what's the difference between being kind to someone and, and, and being good? Well, first of all, being kind is directly linked to how we treat others. You can't be kind when you're by yourself. That, that's very easy. That's just living your life. Kindness is attached to how you treat one another. And goodness is a part of that, but guess what? You can be good whether or not someone sees you or not. You can choose to do the right thing whether someone will ever notice it or not. Being a good worker, keeping your focus and your attention on your work during work hours, even if no one were to ever find out whether you're focusing on your work or focusing on YouTube on your computer. You know, we, we've all done that, right? We've got sucked into that. Uh, we want to watch a two-minute review video on YouTube, and two hours later, we're learning how to make the perfect chocolate chip cookies. Like, what happened to my time? I was focused, and then all of a sudden, I went down this YouTube vortex that sucked me in. Doing good, even when others around don't see you. Doing good, doing the right thing. Let's look at goodness from Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 2, let's read first the first three verses. It says, and you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, 
following the prince of the power in the air. The spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Let's stop there for a second. You might say, Matt, what, why would you share this with us? What does this have to do with being good? I, I don't see anything in this passage of scripture telling us how to be good. But, but before we look at the next part of the scripture, I, I want to point out where goodness should come from. Goodness should start, goodness comes from our awareness of where we would be without God. Because this is it. These verses are where we would be in our life without the goodness of God. If you need motivation to do what is right and to do what is good, look first at where we would be in life without God. Paul says that, that we would be dead to our sin. We would be walking through life without the freedom, the ability to resist the desires of our flesh and body. Paul says we, we've all been there. He says we've all lived there. But then he shows what comes next in verse 4. He says, we've all lived in disobedience. We've all carried out our selfish desires. But I love how verse 4 starts. It says, but God. Somebody say, but God. But God. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. It's a very rich passage of scripture. I love it starts with, but God. But God, in his mercy and his love for us, that even when we were dead to sin, even in that moment, Christ came and he died for us. So did Jesus come out of an obligation for the good things that we had done? No. He had no obligation. You look at Romans, it says, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So our good works have nothing to do with God's goodness to us. Our goodness is only in response to, first and foremost, the goodness of God. Our works do nothing to earn our salvation, right? That's why Ephesians 2.8, it's so powerful. It's, it's a, an important memory verse for us. It says, for by grace, we have been saved. By grace, not of our own self. Nothing that we can boast of. It, it's a dangerous place that we live in. If we live from a place of thinking that we're struggling in order to earn our salvation. It's a very dangerous place for us to be in as Christians. Because there is nothing you could possibly do to earn your salvation. It is the gift of God. It's the grace of God. So we don't do good works to earn our salvation. We don't do them to earn our right standing. We do good works to bless God who gave his only son for us. We do good to thank the Lord. And after Paul says it's the gift of God and he explains what doing good is not, read what he says next in verse 10. Verse 10, he says, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We are prepared for good works. Our first point today, as we look at goodness, first point is made good, do good. Made good, do good. You are the result of God's work. You, as you are right now, you are the workmanship of God. And we know that anything that God creates, he creates good. I know that's not great grammar right there, but it's great. The theologically, it is great. We were created well. Our creation, if you look at the very beginning of time, look at the very first book of the Bible, the first chapter of the Bible, God created everything. And in the last verse of the first book, the first chapter of the Bible, he says he looked over everything that he had made, and he saw that it was very good. We were 
created good. Uh, don't get it twisted. We, we are not self-reliant. We very much need the grace of God in our life. We are not perfect people, but I'm saying that we are created the way God intended us to be. And so if you want to increase the fruit of goodness in your life, you can't expect to do good if you don't first believe good things about yourself. How can that fruit come of your life if you believe the wrong things about you? If you have a poor self-image of how you're looking at yourself and you look at yourself as bad and wrong, how can you expect the fruit of goodness in your life? You're not a mistake. You are God's workmanship. You are not a problem. You are a blessing. You're not a mess. You're not a wreck. You are loved and created by a loving Father. You look good. Turn to someone and say, you look good. Don't make it weird. Don't wink at them unless they're your spouse. But you look good. You do good when you believe you look good. When you live in the confidence of who God says that you are. I think of the words of a very confident NFL quarterback. There's a very successful quarterback named, named Cam Newton. And Cam used to be a really good NFL quarterback. He struggled. This is not a diss. Don't get upset, Tariq. I know you're coming for me. But, but he's had some injuries. He's had some struggles. So he's not quite the same person he once was. But he was doing an interview because not only does Cam love football, but he also loves fashion. He's a big fashion guy. And so in one interview, they're like, what does, what's the connection for you between football and fashion? What does it have to do with anything? And he says, when you look good, you play good. And when you play good, you get paid good. <laughs> That's the connection between fashion and football for me. Wise words from Cam because it's true. How you see yourself determines your actions. You see yourself as a wreck and a failure. Watch how you'll act in response to that. You see yourself as a workmanship of God, a creation by the great creator then you will see that you are created by Jesus for good works that he has prepared for you. So we live from freedom, from salvation. Good works stem from our confidence that we have received that gift of salvation. God's work does not flow from our good works. No, our good works stem from God's good works, what he first did for us. Let's move from the fruit of goodness to the fruit of faithfulness. And faithfulness, we know that's the, that is the fact or the quality of being true to one's words or commitments. As to what you have pledged to do, what you have professed to believe. And faithfulness, we know, is a crucial element in our walk with God. We could easily do an entire sermon on faithfulness. I mean, we could do a series on faithfulness. If you look at the, the book of Hebrews, Hebrews 11, it talks about what each person in the Bible had, had done because of their faith. They call it the hall of faith, some people say. In, in Hebrews 11, it says, by faith we understand that God formed the universe. By faith, Abel brought an acceptable offering to God. By faith, Enoch walked to heaven without dying. By faith. Faith is believing in God, but it's more than that. Faith is active. These men and, and women in the Bible, they achieved great things because of their active faith in God. Faith is, is vital to please and to honor God, right? The Bible says without faith, it's impossible to please God. And thankfully, God makes it very clear how we get more faith. How do we increase faith? Look at Romans 10, 17. It says, so faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. Well, where does faith come from? It comes from the word of God. You need more faith? You need to get into the, what the word of God says for you. And, and notice, you, you need to internalize the promises of God. And, and it says faith comes from what? From hearing and hearing. It's repetition. You don't read it one time and say, good, I got faith. I can live now. I'm good. No, you got to go back to that thing every day. You want more faith? You want that to increase in your life? You have to hear and hear and hear the word of God. The word used in, in Hebrews, I'm sorry, in, in Romans there, is the word rhema in the Greek. Maybe you've heard that word before. But it, it means the voice of God, 
the words of God, the rhema, life-giving word of God over your life. So we know where faith comes from. We know that faith is belief, but just like goodness, it's active. And, and James talks about what faith looks like in action. Look at James chapter 2, verses 14 through 17. And I know we're all over the Bible this morning, but just bear with me. We've got it on the screen for you. James 2, 14, it says, What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, food and, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. James is asking this question, can a faith that is not evident and active actually save you. You see, James is, he's writing to the Jews. The Jewish people for years have lived under the impression that they are only saved because of all the things that they do. They had the Ten Commandments, they had a list of do's and don'ts, and all those things are good to glorify God, but they thought if they did one of those things wrong, they were lacking in their relationship, they were lacking in their salvation experience. So they were living from the struggle of trying to do everything right in order to please God and have salvation. Jesus comes, and they now hear from Paul before, oh, it's only through the gift of God. Right? We saw in Ephesians 2, it's by the grace of God that we are saved. And James is saying that's all true, but if you just then go the other way, and now you're saying we don't have to do acts of service, we don't have to bless people because we're saved automatically. James is saying, well, does that type of faith that is absent in the physical, visible world, does that really save you? How can someone see, how can someone know that you believe in God if they can never see a difference in your life because of what he's done in your life? Can that faith save you? And James is actually adding to what Paul said in Ephesians. Remember, he said the grace that we have been saved, right? So we don't do good works in order to receive salvation. But put it back on the screen, Ephesians 2.8. What does it say? It says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. Don't just stop it for by grace you've been saved. It's through our faith. You're saved by grace through faith. Not works, but your saving faith should have works accompanied with it. There's a quote by John Calvin. I love this. He said, Faith alone saves, but the faith that saves is not alone. It has good works with it. Can you be a person of God faithfully performing good works? You see, goodness is, is what you do. Faithfulness is the consistent manner in which you do it. Goodness is the choice to do what is right, Faithfulness is the choice to continue to do it habitually, consistently, constantly choosing what is right. Our second point, faithfulness is the consistent good. Faithfulness is the consistent good. Consistency matters. Anybody can do the right thing one time. Can you be consistent? Can you be faithful? Can you be faithful at your workplace? Can you be faithful in your marriage? Can you be faithful with, with, with your children? This is what God is asking of us. Can we be consistent men and women of God? Let me show you one example of the goodness and faithfulness together here in the story of the talents. It's our last passage of scripture. Look at Matthew chapter 25, verses 14 through 18. It says this, for it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. He who had received the five talents went at once and traded with them. 
and he made five talents more. So also he who had the two talents made two talents more, but he who had received one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. Let's stop here. So we have this businessman. He's leaving to go on a trip, and he's entrusting his money to his servants. If you didn't know, what, what's, when it says a talent, that means a sum of money. And scholars kind of disagree on how much that money is, but it's substantial. We're talking about a couple weeks of salary per talent, at least, okay? At least. And so they are entrusting these servants, and that was normal, to, to find reliable servants that you could entrust some of your money with while you're gone. Because when someone was going on travel and, and a journey in those days, there was not a great estimate of how long this journey was going to take. You know, we're lucky when we have flights that we know how long it takes to get from one place to another. It feels like right now, sometimes we don't know if that flight is actually reliable, but you know what I'm saying. It was a little bit more reliable. You're not relying on the seasons, and maybe you hit a storm and something that stops your journey and slows you down. So a businessman would have to entrust his money, not just to be protected while he's gone, but to grow it while he's gone. And so these three different servants are all given different amounts, right? Five and two and one. And the first servant with five talents, notice what it says he does. He, he says, at once. He went right away. When the boss man left, he went right away. He didn't procrastinate, and he went and invested the money that he had received. We don't know what exactly he did with it, if he invested it in a business, if he got on the ground floor of Apple or whatever he did. Maybe he built up a business for him. Whatever he did, he gained five additional talents. So it was the same for the servant with two, right? He, he went and he doubled his amount by adding two more. But the one who had received one talent, he took it and he dug into the ground and hid the master's money. Now, it was common, it was a common practice to bury valuables to keep them protected. That's not the issue. The issue is that the third servant didn't understand the assignment. He wasn't just supposed to protect the money. He was supposed to grow what God had given him. You know, you and I, we are supposed to grow what God has given us in our life. And in order to grow things, it, it sometimes takes risk, right? There is risk associated with stepping out of our comfort zone. And allowing God to grow us. That was free. I just added that in this morning. But hopefully that was good. <laughs> let's go back to the scripture. Let's, let's look at how the master responds when he comes back from his journey. Read with me from 19. It says, Now after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. And he who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five talents more saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here I have made five talents more. And his master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. Well done, good and faithful servant. I gotta be honest, when I was writing this message, I'm like, I don't know if I can put these two together. And then I found that scripture. And I said, we can do it. I'm gonna find a way. Good and faithful servants. And you can apply this to, to a lot of different things. Scholars say when, when it comes to talent, you can apply this to how you are careful with your money, how you're careful with the gifts and the talents God has given you, careful with your time. All that is important. What matters most is God is saying, are you using what God has given you to be good and faithful as a servant of him? He says, well done, good and faithful servant. To me, that means in the eyes of God, good and faithfulness is success to God. Notice what the master said. He didn't say, well done, good and successful servant. Well done, good and influential servant. No, he says faithfulness is the recipe for success in the kingdom of God. Goodness and faithfulness. Success is being faithful to do what God has called you to do. Nothing more and nothing less. You want to know how I know that? Because look what happens to the next servant. Read what happens to the next servant. Verses 22 and 23. 
It says, he also who had the talents came forward, saying, Master, you delivered to me two talents. Here I have made two talents more. His master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. The man with two talents, who doubled what he had to four, I promise, typically, there's no math in my sermon, but just think for a second. The one started with five, the other started with two. Person with two doubled to four. Uh, check out, does that math check out for you? The person who started with five started with more than the other guy ended with. And God didn't say that, the master didn't say, well, that's, yeah, that's pretty good. What did he say? He said the exact same thing to both servants. He said, well done, good, and faithful servant. It's not about how much you have. It's about how faithful you are with whatever God has entrusted you. You know that? Whatever God has put in your hands. Our last point, number three, faithfulness starts small. The master says you've been faithful with a little. I will give you more. Maybe you're sitting there today and you're a part of your life where you're saying, God, where's the more? I want more, and that's, there's nothing wrong with that attitude, but I would challenge you back and say, what are you doing right now with the little that you have? What are you, looking, what are you overlooking right now in your life that you're not noticing that God has given you and entrusted to you? Because why, why should you receive more if you're not faithful with what you have? Don't say, oh, I'll start blessing people when I have X amount of dollars. Don't say, oh, I'll start tithing once I have this amount of dollars in the bank. Don't say, I'll start volunteering once I have X amount of time on my life. Start investing now. Start being faithful with the little that you have right now. Because guess what? If you're not healthy now, don't wait for that person, perfect person to come along into your life to say, I'll get healthy then. I'll start focusing on my relationship once we get married. No, be faithful with what you have right now. Because God is the rewarder of those who take what the little he's given them, and, and they are faithful with that, and they grow that. Because I don't know about you, but more than anything, when I get to the end of my life, I want to come before God, and for him to say to me, well done, good and faithful servant. Amen. That's what matters. Worship team, you can come join me as we get ready to close. One last part of faithfulness in the small. And it talks about it in Luke 16 as well. This is the last verse of the morning. Luke 16, 10 says, one who is faithful in a very little is also faithful in much. And he who is dishonest in a very little is also dishonest in much. The fruit of faithfulness in your life will be seen by how you handle the small or the big things. David was faithful as a shepherd boy, and that qualified him to be the king of all of Israel. Joseph was a, was a slave. He was faithful as a slave to work hard, and that qualified him to become second in command of all of Egypt. Ruth was faithful with a relationship with her friend Naomi, who she barely knew, and that qualified her to eventually find the man of her dreams in Boaz. Abraham was faithful with, with one son, one son that he finally had, and that qualified him to become the father of all Israel. Faithful in the small things. What is something small that God has given you that you can be more faithful with? Maybe it's a talent or an ability. Maybe it's a person, a friend, a relationship. Can you be faithful with that entry-level job? I know it's not what you want to do for the rest of your life. I know it's tough sometimes getting up and going to work because it's not the work you want, but can you be faithful there? Can you show God you can be faithful there? Because then he's willing to give you more. Can you be faithful? Students, getting ready to go back to school. I know geometry is terrible. I know it doesn't make sense sometimes. Can you be faithful with those small classes? 
because you're going to have classes that you need later in life. And if you get into this habit of not focusing now on a class that you don't like, you might stay in that habit and then you're not focusing when there's something you've got to pay attention to that helps you later in life. Can you be faithful in the small things now? Good and faithful servant. I think about John C. Maxwell, and maybe you've read some of his books on leadership. He says, yeah, everybody wants to do what I do now. Everybody wants the platform that I have now. They say, how do, how do I get to do what you do? He says, you don't get to do what I do until you do what I've done. You don't know what I've started with. You don't know the things that I did when it was just me and God that helped me become the person that I am now that you see in front of you. We get so caught up in doing the things that we see people doing, we don't know that maybe they were just faithful in the small things that got them to the bigger things. You see, we do good to show people. We do good to show people our commitment to God. And I think we live faithfully to show God our commitment to people. Goodness and faithfulness. Goodness is a reflection of godliness. Faithfulness is that consistent follow-through each and every day. Would you stand with me as we close? As we close this morning, I just want to give an opportunity as the worship team sings one last song to reflect on the good and the faithfulness that you can be in your everyday life. Two questions I want you to think about. Do you see yourself as good? Again, I don't mean that I'm saying you're a perfect person, you don't need God, you don't need people. I'm saying do you see yourself as the work, the creation of God? Because it is too so hard to do goodness in your life if you don't believe good about yourself. And second of all, think about, is there somewhere that I'm missing God? Is there an area in my life that I can be more faithful in the small things? Is there an area that I've been neglecting? Show me God right now where I can be. The worship team is going to lead us, and I'll come up with a prayer as we end. Let's worship together.